Good afternoon. Um, so thank you very much for having Virginia and myself here. Now, imagine being in Vermont on back road and uh, okay, okay, let's see if this is gonna work. In an old barn that's about to get torn down, imagine finding a box of manuscripts covered and crusted in pigeon poop. Uh, <laughs> layers of it. But once you pull that off, imagine seeing that these manuscripts bear the name of whoops, Burn. Who do you think of? Well, mm, yeah, mm. unfortunately. <laughs> Herman Gorn. Yeah. Yep. Well, it wasn't his, but it was Eugenie Gorin. But how was she related? When, again, uh, you know, what's in a name? Was she a sympathizer? Uh, was she trying to escape her family's uh, legacy and what was going on back in Germany? There's a lot to this story. Uh, there's also two great documentaries that I want to refer you to. And you can find that information also at the end of my article. But uh, many families from that era here, there are many descendants, especially in the US and Brazil, that are, some are trying to totally deny their family and what went on. In some cases, there are folks uh, getting sterilized so that there won't be any more descendants. Others are going out to the communities and trying to educate the younger populations that don't even know about the Holocaust, World War II, and all these things that we don't want happening again. Uh, the second one is not about Her Herman, uh, but actually his younger stepbrother, Albert Gordon. Has anybody heard about him? Very interesting. Only one person has. Uh, actually, back in 2010, a British uh, author did a lot of research and found out that Albert uh, actually saved hundreds of Jews' names, uh, Jews during the um, Holocaust by using his name to run interference. And then later, he was arrested uh, by the uh, Allies as they came in because they didn't want to hear his story or whatever. I mean, uh, and so over the course of several years, he finally put together a list of 34 prominent Jews, and those people came forward and spoke on his behalf, and he was eventually free. So that's the flip side of using a name to do good. But going back to this box of music, here we have really the only picture um, that I've been able to track down of Eugenie. This is her in a Bavarian costume. As you can see, she was born in uh, St. Petersburg. And then, what's all the story about her life? You know, how did she end up in the US and how did she die in East Har uh, Hartford? And why are her ashes in this small cemetery up in Windsor? Well. It, even in this day and age, it's been hard to find much information, and there's been a lot of discrepancies in trouble, trying to verify facts. So you're going to see that I have to keep going back to the box of music for clues. So this is page one of two of the manuscripts, and I've actually brought uh, the three that Virginia is going to be performing this afternoon. Um, that were in that box. Now, in addition to, uh, and a lot of the manuscripts were only concepts, uh, sketches, incomplete. Uh, so she actually didn't come to the U.S. until uh, around 1921. So these, the first two, three works are actually what you will hear this afternoon. So. Uh, how did she end up in Windsor? In 1920, this is a terrible picture, it's a passport picture of Dr. Mary Important of Windsor. Uh, after taking care of her mother, who passed, Dr. Horton, who was also a suffragist, uh, went over to Munich 
and uh, for one of the international conferences. And because she was also an amateur violinist and soprano, she at a music event met Gorin, and they became fast friends. And it was her home, which she called the hut, which is really much more a very comfortable sort of Swiss uh, chalet on the side of Mount Viscotti, uh, where Dr. Horton and her life companion, Miss Benedict, Anna Benedict, lived. And Goring was the uh, guest that stayed for uh, several decades. <laughs> uh, so you will hear more about that. But this, I know it's hard to read, but this is one of many of the uh, ship manifests uh, between 19. 21 to 1939, during that time span, Goring traveled back and forth 12 round trips. And during that time, guess who ended up on the same ship? Uh, seven, uh, seven of those times was Dr. Horton. Now, it's not just a snap of a button to find that because well, we don't have TSA back in those days, <laughs> uh, where everything is cross-reference. Uh, so I had to look under the mul six multiple spellings for Goring, and that Goring would have been on uh, the manifest of alien passengers. That does not cross-reference with American citizens and their passport photos, etc. And then there was also, they were traveling in different classes, and then there was, to add to all of that, in this case, Gorin is notated as widow and uh, just a household uh, as employment instead of as a teacher. Uh, and notice she says Windsor is her home. But uh, what's interesting is during these 12 trips that she was taking back and forth, at some time she was listed as married, widowed, divorced, but the last name never changed. So, you know, again, was that a matter of a convenience as a single woman traveling or, or what? And during the same time, she still had this listing in Munich. So you see, the old phone listings also list your profession. So here we have a beautiful, uh, picture. I think Goring took this of Dr. Marianne Horton. And we're now going to hear the song with the upwards. <laughs> took care of uh, Eugenie Goring late in her life up to her death. The uh, reason uh, Goring died down in Connecticut was actually, at that point, 
they bought a home for wintering there and still back to the hut for the good weather um, up on in Windsor. Now this, and you can look again at these manuscripts later, this is the uh, closing inscription on the ten variations on a theme by Corelli. And as you can see, it's inscribed to another Eugene, Schumann. This was the youngest daughter of Robert and Clara. And it appears that uh, the two Eugenies, that uh, Goring did work with Schumann. But I, I had to double check the handwriting. Now let's see if we've got that. Okay. This is uh, Schumann's handwriting because I was going back and forth checking. There are so many cross outs and corrections in the uh, collection of manuscripts. Did this appear? No. So, I mean, it's so distinctive from the more uh, coarse uh, calligraphy by Gorin. But uh, basically, the reputation, repetition of the themes at the end were um, as recommended or advised by Schumann. Now, in contrast to Gorin living here in New England, and hanging out with uh, Dr. Horton and Miss Benedict, uh, were, that, were, were those two a uh, lesbian couple? We don't know for sure, but many in town, yes, that went unspoken. I've interviewed a lot of people for bits of information about all three women. And they were by the caretaker's family, who was very devoted and also wrote memoirs. Um, they always refer to it as the women in the hut, and uh, Dr. Horton was a very prominent person about town. She was actually the granddaughter of the of, uh, Robbins family, which owned the gun manufacturing plant right in the middle of Windsor, which later became, I think, Preci Precision Tools. And uh, her father was a, a, a veteran, and well, you'll see the rest of the story. So there's still a lot of questions, you know. Was there any influence there in terms of guns, uh, all these other relationships? But back to Schumann. She was over in London, and her uh, partner was the famous soprano, uh, Maria Fullinger. And it was through her that Goring also became introduced to the Princess Elizabeth von Hohenlohen? Hohenlohen. Yeah. Of Bavaria. Bavaria. And um, that is a whole nother story, but there is another piece that we did not bring that was uh, in honor of her. So, we're not going to do all ten. We'll do the seven best. <laughs> um, uh, and here's the rundown of the variations that Virginia's going to perform. <laughs>
of the caregiver uh, who uh, relayed to me a story about the ice, uh, the ice house. So they were coming back to the US and Dr. Horton had wired ahead, sent a telegram to Fred Scales, who was her chauffeur, right-hand person, caretaker. Nice name, Scales, musical Scales. Anyway, uh, and Mr. Scales was to prepare the ice house and get ice in there. Well, the uh, feds basically uh, intercepted that telegram and they thought something sinister was afoot. Maybe there was a dead body or something to put on uh, ice. No, it was really just because the hut, you know, they didn't even want to phone there. They used spring water, there was a garden, etc. They butchered their own. Um, uh, pig and cow for the meat and so forth. So, but that's how they suddenly realized, oh, we're being watched. Oh, there's other people that were close to them, basically almost being informants. So there's a lot of, you know, back and forth on how those stories compare, um, what the truth might have been. But there were quite a few people that collaborated on that particular story. There's also, um, the U.S. government made a note of that Dr. Goring was getting a German newspaper that had become the uh, propaganda vehicle. It was a trans-ocean uh, newspaper and they had tried to get Yale to subscribe to it and a number of other universities here in New England uh, who all politely refused, but uh, Goring was a subscriber for three months. But does that mean she was a Nazi sympathizer? We don't know that for sure. And uh, again, in terms of hearsay and trying to verify things, there is also the story of uh, Goring uh, lamenting uh, in private amongst a few people. Oh, why doesn't 
uh, Germany give Hit Hitler what he wants for Aldol. Now I'm saying it with no inflection on purpose because without knowing the tone, it could be sarcastic or it could be in sympathy. It all depends on the tone. And this was also relayed th three generations down. So again, I can't just go at that reaction saying, oh, she was a sympathizer or whatever. So moving along, uh, I think we should go to the struggle of the Amazons. So, <laughs> which, it, it's interesting that she chose that title, you know? Uh, and this is an undated piece, uh, but it's still around that time frame, either right before the piece written in dedication to Schumann or soon after. So this is definitely, in, again, in, in honor or in influence, though it's not written down, but her friends, Benedict and Horton. <laughs> system of one queen going out to war and the other taking care of at home and keeping the home fires going. So let's see what else. Well, this I can stumble across during doing research. It says Land of Hospitality, 1939, discounted air, uh, uh, ship fare to uh, Germany. Not many takers. Yeah. <laughs> and this was in the uh, American newspapers, this author. At that point, uh, actually, oh, did you want to drop it? <laughs> anyway, um, 
At that time, even uh, German nationals were told that it was not safe to travel back and forth. So Goring was um, upset that she couldn't get back and uh, she was frantic to go back. Her money was all, by the way, all this time during the war, her money was locked up in Germany, or so she said. You know, even earlier, who was financing all her travel back and forth. I couldn't even tra track that down. And then once uh, the war ended, she was like, no, I'm staying here in New England. She never did go back to Germany again. And uh, so her ashes were scattered here in the Horton plot. These two researchers are from Windsor. The woman on the left is an archivist uh, for the town. And the woman on the right, Kathy Hoyt, has um, uh, been mapping out all the different graves and find, find a grave, et cetera, for all the different cemeteries around the Windsor County. And the other person is uh, Barbara Road. And uh, behind them, the low stone is Dr. Horton. The stone in the middle is her mother, Melinda Robbins Horton Fullerton, because husband number one is on this side and the matching headstone on the other side. Hey, they all get along. It's husband number two, uh, Fullerton, who basically since age, when Horton was age six, raised her. And then scattered amongst the quartet there is Goring's ashes. Miss Benedict uh, outlived them all and isn't even there. Okay. Uh, oops, and just two more slides. This large book plate, you know, the size of a regular piece of paper, <coughs> framed book plate was actually in the box of manuscripts along with these works and also the published music of the time that Horton and Goring played together, Greek sonatas, etc., a uh, number of Schumann songs. But this is by a close friend that would come and visit all the time, William Ritter, the architect. Uh, and this is a very, uh, this ex view doesn't exact, it doesn't exist, the part with the doorway. Yes, that's Mount Escutney in the back, but the hut was on the side of Mount Escutney, right near the ski area. Uh, so this very stylistic doorway with the two urns, etc. You know, did that represent Benedict and Horton or Goring and Horton? Anyway, that was a memento that Goring had with her music stuck away in that barn. Uh, in in the house, also the current owners had found this plaque that used to hang over the doorway. Why shouldn't we? And that was from that time period. Now, what did it mean to <laughs> the women? We can only guess. And here you can see that was the first slide we started with. So uh, when my friend Ron Sepatelli bought this property along Route 44, on the other side, up above the word Horton, would have been where the hut was, which is now owned by other people. And uh, the current owners were first very helpful and warm, uh, in terms of research that I was doing. But when you read the article online, you will see their rebuttal towards me. Um, and I chose not to respond to that. So I had to pull the historic photos that they had agreed to uh, lend me for the article. But anyway, so. The hut is on the other side. The barn is now where this impression was, or where the impression is rather here. You can see the foundation. Mm -hmm. And it was less than five feet from the edge of the road. The barn, in fact, was a health hazard because somebody could have fallen through. Oh. So at least he saved the music because everything else apparently was, you know, broken bed frames, etc., and junk. And uh, Ron has no background in music, especially not classical music, but he recognized the name and that's why he held on to it. Mm -hmm. And he had no idea that my past life for 20 some years was a music librarian. He knew me only through a board that I s served on and he knew me as a 
senior move manager, and that's how he gave me the box to track down. So here's the link to the article, and that's it. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah. I'm sorry, I think I missed the connection between Eugenie and the Gurren family. What did you discover that in her actual of, relationship was to the family? Oh, in terms of Herman Gordon? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Hearsay said that she had married one of Gurren's brothers. That's wrong, actually. Uh, it would have had to have been one of his older brothers, and there is absolutely no uh, record to correspond to that. Also, looking at the uh, ages, etc., I have tried endless routes coming from Herman, coming from Eugene, coming from other angles on Ancestry.com, other genealogy sites. I have never been able to find it. This is a challenge if anybody wants to try and track it down, but somehow I have not found a direct link. They are connected. As best as I can find, it's something like a second cousin. And it may be even more distant than that. But not a sister. Not a sister, not a direct relative, no. So it's Alice brought the music. I teach at Keene State now. And just a year ago, she came um, into the adjunct office. And it was interesting. I love dead women. Or <laughs> <laughs> I have a reputation. I will play anything for anybody, anywhere, anytime. But playing music with pigeon poop falling down on your this fingers. This was one that had just been handed oh to me, God. and we were still pulling it out. It was, it was, don't worry, this is clean, you don't need to look. But we were going through it, trying to see, does this have merit? Right. Some, some of the pieces were rather weak, and a lot of them were just sketches, concepts, as I said. So, But it's, it's but, interesting. I, for, um, my hands are always my detectives. Her music is so reminiscent of Fanny Mendelssohn. You know, the, the phrases roll off, and you can't help but feel that, of course, the friendship with Absolutely. the uh, Schumann daughter oh, is yes. yeah, very revealing, and it's very playable music. So, you know, it would be perfect for a setting like this, you know, mm -hmm. young women, students playing. And I've always, I've performed here many times, wonderful pianos upstairs, but it's interesting to me that Smith with the great Sophia Smith Library, they have never really linked horns, Alice, with performances of women composers. You look at, you look at the archives, and I always, and I ask you that because Alice has been an incredible resource and helped me because I, I'm only a performer. I don't write and I don't research, and things are brought to me, and I'm, a, I'm sort of like a, you know, a handmaiden or a midwife or something to projects. But, and she helped me put together a two prize winning series uh, called First Ladies of Music, which told the story of women composers, because before we died, we wanted it to be sort of recorded, because it seemed like we were always inventing ourselves in our 20s when we first met. I uh, used to play at GPH, and she, you were a young intern. And then you get to be 30 and 40 and 50, and then all these young women say, well, there aren't any women composers. And it's like, yes, there were. So show, you know, show me the beef. So we, Alice came up with wonderful ideas. And I have always said to my students, and I mentor many graduate students, and I'm thrilled to do it, go to a librarian. Mm -hmm. They hold the keys to the treasures. Butter them up. Find out what, what, <laughs> what they like yeah, and give it to them. <laughs> and I'll tell you one quick story. Years ago, I was involved with Sister Nancy Fierro, who's a, a nun, you know, Sisters of Jesus, at the big convent where um, Sister Corita came from in L.A. And uh, first time I met her, you know, she looked like you. She was just attractive with pants and everything on. I had no idea she was a nun because I, I wanted the, the cope and everything. And I said, well, how do you... How did you get all that De La Guerre music or all that? She seemed to have rare scores that the Bibliothèque Nationale, you know, in Paris had. And she said, "Well, I tell you," and I leaned forward. I, you know, she said, "I wear my habit in Europe, and I have many coins buried underneath." <laughs> and I go, and the librarians are very fussy, very rude, you know, in Europe. And I said, "Yeah, tell me about it." Well. I borrow the scores, and I go and I stick under me my, my robes, and I go down a whole floor, and I give her the Xerox, and a nun telling me this, and I was 
gobsmacked. <laughs> this, this is the way you did research, you know, in the 70s. Talk about a pioneer field. There was no interest, there was no money, there was, it was nothing. And so to meet somebody who was a librarian, who was knowledgeable, you're also a musician, and you helped me so incredibly. And then of course I was embedded at Northeastern and I was very lucky, I had a record label and I had funding and I never looked back. And we were also, we, ha we were lucky. The 70s was a volatile time. Women rip ripping off their bars, you know, bras, smoking cigars. I got major management and I said, I'm only gonna play women composers. And Columbia artists said, don't start with that crap. I'll never forget my agent, he was so rude. I said, excuse me? And then, one year later, he called me into the office, Doug Sheldon, he's still there, he manages Audi so through Mutter and things like, like that. And he said, one year later, this would have been 78, you better keep on with that women crap. You know, he couldn't, even, <laughs> he couldn't even say the word. I said, why? He said, well, because it was community concerts and the worm had turned. Now all of a sudden it was trendy. So you have Miss Magazine, you've got Gloria Steinem, you've got Vogue. I had a big article about Beach and Vogue Magazine. Again, we never look back, but that was luck. I don't know that those things would ever happen again, that kind of constellation where media needed articles. They needed, you know, chum for. So where do we come out today? It's a lot better. You pick up any copy of the New York Times or the New Yorker magazine, or I travel a great deal still. Gubaglina, there are performers who are routinely perform, you know, including all kinds of music, not just by women, but living composers, and it's not, it's, it's here, and so we're much healthier. I don't, I would never say that women are equal still, in any way. That's a long way off, so, anyway. Yeah, well, um, you said in your article that you have no evidence of any kind of concerts she was involved with or teaching in Windsor, right? Uh, right. Uh, again, there was hearsay that she was a ballet teacher in mm -hmm. Windsor, but I can't find any records of that locally or otherwise either. Uh, there are the only programs that I found were in. Actually, that's over on the shelf there. The Christmas cantata that she obsessed about and rewrote, it was in 14 uh, sections and for children's choir, women's choir, organ, and a couple of strings. That got a number of performances, uh, first written in, I think, something like 1909 or 1912. And she kept rewriting that until almost her death. 1941 and so that was public performances but otherwise nothing on the other I was wondering actually whether there was any way you could find out whether she had any association with other artists in Vermont for example I right couldn't find the any river is the, the St. Gordon's um, arts call I found no collabor nothing collaboration else. yeah <laughs> the only person she played with was uh, Dr. Horton those uh, Greek sonatas etc uh, and I found all that many, uh, all of that sheet music there. And that's an interesting thing, though, because at yeah. St. Gaudens, he played the flute. His wife played the piano. I've oh, gone there yeah. because of McDowell and New Hampshire composers. Yeah. And there's some stuff with flute. Yeah. So his True. idea, that's the kind of so, linkage. So, I mean, it, it, it's still an open door to, for further research, but I haven't come across any connections yet. So, can you, oh, sorry. I was just wondering, can you perform, um, can you publish that's a big determinant. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm holding on to this as a well, it's a loan from Ron, but it, it, it's meaningless actually to him because he doesn't know what to do with it. Um, and it probably should be published. Uh, again, a lot of them are incomplete, but you know, or or it should be donated to a college or a university, frankly. Uh, so, you know, I was trying to put more pieces together. This was only handed to me, when was it? Just a last year February. Ago. No, it was April. Yeah, you came uh, okay, so we've April. been just, you know, it's not doing this year. in our free time, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, you had a I question. I was going to ask the same question about the manuscripts, about publication, but what about recording? 
Yeah. I defer to, it's a beautiful yep. question. I, and I do a lot of this. I discovered this is a Croatian question. woman, and I'm recording that music. And that link, that, that, the woman who established the Kapralova link is an angel. Her name is Carla Hartel. She's Czech, and she's in Toronto. And she works with the Toronto Film Board. And she personally funds, and if you want to tie into a major blog, and I networked Alice with her, and she already knew about you because of First Ladies. Right. And so she published the article that Alice put together a year ago, because you have to have documentation. You can have yeah, that very was good music. Yeah. You've got you to have backup. And that she could fund, I mean, it would be an incredible project for a, a student here. <coughs> Bless you, junior year abroad, go. What about the Goering family? I started thinking that there must be Goering still, you know? No? Yeah, there is. Awesome. Actually, there is a, a descendant uh, here in the States. She's a, one of the first people interviewed in the um, Hitler's Children uh, document. You have to be very, very careful because the minute you start making money off something, right. it's forbidden, and we would never do that. And so you're, you're, and you know that as librarians. You know that about source, and you know that about copyright. And so doing something like this, where nobody gets paid, it's pure. But the minute you start, that's what's happened with the Holocaust. There are people now making money off of the composers who went to Auschwitz. That's you know, very ugly. So yeah, this has to be handled yeah. carefully. But librarians, anybody want to you know, come up with ideas and so forth? Um, librarians are just fabulous, because the way your brains catalog information and just like that man, you know, he immediately made that kind of a link. I've thrown myself on so many librarians, mercy, and they, they'll point you, Mary Jane, and you see, I mean, they're, they're caves of treasure, and you guys know where it's buried, and you just stumble in, and you know, you also do on your own computers, you have incredible research tools and engines. Any other questions? Or? Yeah. Care to speculate on reasons for the um, frequent trips to Germany other than just pleasure? <laughs> I yeah. have different theories, but I can't substantiate yeah. them. Yeah, so. There was a singer who lived in Winchenden. Uh, I always meant to tell you because yeah. a man asked me to. She was Swedish and she's a big star, and I paid a sec um, Elisa Bird's Eye, you know, mm -hmm. the librarian in Boston, and she did a yeah. library. Same thing, she went to the masthead. Mm -hmm. And that woman sang for Liszt, interesting, in Weimar. And they wanted me to redo a program. And I said, well, you've got to show me the composers. But she sang in Boston. She, there, you know, you, but it's, it's sort of like forensics. You have a lot of leads, and then it just dead ends. There were so many dead ends in this uh, project. And again, this was trying to do it very quickly. I got the music, or the box, last April. Um, through your connection, I needed to get that article submitted by September 1st. Uh, so, you know, there were time constraints and also, I'm not in this field anymore, so I have to run a business I just started. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, yes. So, so Alice, did they find any other personal effects? Or did they what? Just, did they find any other personal effects that were identifiable? There was a broken piano, uh, and that was it. Uh, you know, except for the plaque that was yeah. hanging in the house, that was it. There were other photographs, black and white photographs, and um, actually a number of uh, charcoal sketches by Goring, uh, and a lot of the photographs were taken by Goring, but I don't, uh, because this family that wrote a letter afterwards to the editor, uh, they broke the agreement on that, so I, though I have those files, I can't use them. And she was not a very good uh, artist, so she was a very, very uh, talented uh, photographer, though. But they were all pictures of daily life there at Windsor, and she wasn't, you know, in front of the uh, uh, camera. Yes, uh, kind of that we need to go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.